Okay, I'm excited that Emily Hazelwood is here. Um, she does some really incredible work. Emily is a marine biologist, offshore energy consultant, and entrepreneur. Today, she's going to talk to us about her work building solutions for conservation in really unlikely places. In 2018, Emily was recognized on Forbes' 30 Under 30 list in the energy sector for her work developing sustainable, creative, and cost-effective solutions for environmental issues that surround the offshore energy industry, of all things. Really interesting. Emily is a PADI certified dive master, an ambassador diver, and Scuba Pro Deep Elite team member. Uh, so I think you know that we are about to go underwater, um, take us to the biodiversity under the sea with Emily. So I'm going to bring her in. Hello, Emily. Hi, Brianna. How are you? I'm doing well. So great to have you here today for Glo Global BioFest. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Now, I know a little bit about this work. I've, I've heard about it because it is a really unique way of tackling environmental um, issues and really increasing the biodiversity of um, the underwater. So I'm excited to hear from you and I'll um, let you take it away from here. Great. That sounds good. All right. All right. I'm yep. going to share my screen here. Perfect. We'll bring that up. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, we're good to go. All right, well, thank you for having me. As Brianna mentioned, I'm Emily Hazelwood. And this afternoon, I'm going to be telling all of you a story. A story that looks at rigs as reefs, repurposing offshore oil and gas platforms as permanent artificial reef installations. <laughs> In California, California, there are 27 offshore oil and gas platforms. These platforms are made of steel, and they look like big industrial giants out there. And all these platforms have booming ecosystems that exist below the surface. So our story starts above the surface, where throughout the Gulf of Mexico and in California and really in every ocean on the planet, we find these menacing industrial giants, offshore oil and gas platforms. But just like the tip of the iceberg, there's so much more below the surface. And we need to start to think about, with so many offshore oil and gas platforms found in every ocean on the planet, what are we going to be doing when the oil wells dry up, especially when you consider that removing these structures, some the size of the Empire State Building, is extremely, has extreme environmental impacts, extreme costs, and extreme carbon footprints associated with their removal. Especially when you think about that just below the surface exists some of the most robust and productive marine ecosystems on the planet. Now that's saying a lot for an offshore oil and gas platform. But in California, we see numerous species of jack mackerel, strawberry anemones and scallops that you see pictured here. We even see, find our state saltwater fish, the Garibaldi. Now, Rick Reefs presents an opportunity for offshore oil and gas operators to modify their platform structures so that they can continue to support marine life as a permanent artificial reef structure. There are a couple ways of doing this. They could tow it to an alternative location, they could topple the whole structure onto its side, or they can remove the upper portion of the structure and leave the remaining jacket standing in place as an artificial reef. But before I go any further, 
What exactly is an artificial reef? For not everything we place in our oceans can be considered a successful and thriving reef. There are a few characteristics that we find that make oil platforms special. But we do see a lot of examples of artificial reefs, from reef balls, where scientists place these structures on the seafloor to understand how marine life will grow and colonize on a structure. Artists have also had their own take on this program, placing installations on the seafloor to observe how the marine life that grows there can actually enhance their art. But what makes an oil platform such an excellent candidate for an artificial reef? Well, the answer lies in the structure itself. Stretching from seafloor to sea surface, these platforms can be as tall as the Empire State Building. That creates a lot of real estate for marine life to grow and colonize on the structure. Additionally, these platforms are very complex, lots of beams and cross beams, which create nooks and crannies for marine life to call their home. And as you'll see in this picture, Oil platforms also create a very unique circle of life. In California, at the top of the platform structure, as you can see in this photo, we have lots of scallops and anemones. And when those scallops die, they fall to the very base of the platform structure, creating enormous shell mounds. Now these shell mounds are then colonized by a variety of species of fish, but most importantly, rockfish, who will use the shells to lay their eggs. Their baby fish will hatch amongst the shells and use that area as a nursery before eventually migrating back up to the top of the platform structure, creating this very unique circle of life where all components of the platform are very important. In fact, most, if not all, of the adult species of rockfish are now found exclusively on California's oil platforms. Research, research that's come out of the University of Santa Barbara and others have indicated that some of California's platforms are actually some of the most productive habitats globally, more productive than salt marshes and more productive even so than rainforests. Now, there are some pros and cons associated with the program. That's not always good to reef an offshore oil platform. We need to think about each structure on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's what we do at Blue Latitudes. So some of the first cons that we see with the Rigs to Reefs program is that there's lack of clarity in the legislation. For what works in the Gulf of Mexico doesn't always work in other regions of the world. It's not a one-size-fits-all program. In the Gulf of Mexico, they've reefed between 500 and 600 offshore oil and gas platforms. Now that stands in stark contrast to California where we have 27 platforms and not a single platform has been reefed. We do see that starting to change with global programs developing and countries such as Thailand and Malaysia have been reefing their very first platforms in the last few years. We also wanna think about what's the carrying capacity of our oceans? In other words, how many of these structures can we reef before it becomes ocean dumping? Now, this is a very important question that we wanna think about because even though oil and gas, it's on its way out, offshore wind is on its way in. And we see some of the same issues being encountered by offshore wind developers. Well, fortunately, or unfortunately, we're losing much of the hard substrate or materials such as rocks and reefs in our oceans. And this material is very important for species to make their homes on. And oil and gas platforms in total only make up about 2% of the total hard substrate available. So it's really more of a band-aid when you consider the loss of all the hard substrate our ocean has been experiencing. We also wanna think about the spread of invasive species. Offshore oil and gas platforms have the unique ability to act as stepping stones. Found in blue ocean environments, they're able to allow species such as the lionfish that you see pictured here and orange cup coral to spread from platform to platform to areas they may not normally be able to reach because of the vastness of the ocean. So this is something we really wanna think about because we do find many of these invasive species on offshore platforms. There's also the lack of public understanding, and this is something that we really work hard on at Blue Latitudes. We're not save the whales, we're save the oil platforms, and that inherently comes with a lot of challenges. 
most people, when they see an offshore oil and gas platform, they don't think to themselves, beautiful, thriving reef. They think of the BP oil spill, Exxon Valdez oil spill. They certainly aren't thinking about the marine life potential that exists just below the surface. So our goal is to use the latest scientific research as well as photos and videos to be able to take everyone diving with us to truly appreciate the beauty of these offshore oil and gas platforms and discover that silver lining that they represent. And finally, there is a unique con that's presented by these oil platforms in that by placing these structures in the sea floor, you're actually inhibiting access from, for other ocean users to have access to the resources that are found there. Now, other fishermen might be utilizing these areas as well as people looking to put down offshore wind turbines or offshore cables. As I shared, these platforms are as big as the Empire State Building. They take up a lot of space. And when you're placing them on the sea floor, you need to think about other ocean users that could be impacted. But on the other side of the coin, there are significant pros associated with the Rigs to Reach program. And primarily one of the biggest pros is the ecological benefits. Some of these platforms, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, are widely believed to support the majority of the red snapper populations that are found there. They have other, there are numerous other fishery species that also have see a positive benefit from these platforms, but considering research has found them to be some of the among, among the most productive reef ecosystems out there, we really want to start to think about how we can preserve more of this habitat. The other pro is that these offshore platforms can help compensate, compensate for habitat loss. In California and in the Gulf of Mexico and really in our oceans worldwide, we're losing our reefs at significantly, incre increasingly faster and faster rates. These platforms in their own unique way provide unique and productive habitats that may help to compensate for that habitat loss. There's also the opportunity to reduce pollution by repurposing existing materials. Worldwide, we see multiple examples of folks trying to repurpose existing materials to create reefs. Now, some of those that can create successful reefs, those that are using concrete or reef balls, those tend to make very successful reefs. But we also see people that use materials that may not make for the most successful reef. And we're talking about materials that were never designed to go in the ocean in, to, in the first place, such as subway cars or toilets and tires. Those materials can break down over time. What makes oil platforms unique is that they were designed to stay in the ocean and they were designed to withstand within the ocean for long periods of time, making them really excellent candidates for artificial reefs. We also see a pro of ecotourism in California and in the Gulf of Mexico and most recently in Malaysia where they've converted an offshore platform into an ecotourism resort. These platforms present unique opportunities to go diving on these structures. And diving on these structures is unlike any experience I've had diving anywhere else. And I've been diving for nearly 20 years now. I've never experienced anything like the 3D landscape of an offshore oil platform, nor have I seen the levels of marine life and abundance on offshore structures like this one. There's also significant economic benefits. Let's say it costs around $1 million to totally remove an offshore oil platform and take it on shore to be recycled. If that oil platform is instead reefed, it costs about $500,000, resulting in a $500,000 cost savings. Now that cost savings doesn't go directly back to the oil company. In fact, it gets split with half going back to the oil company and the other half, a sizable $250,000, going back to the state into an endowment for marine preservation and conservation. And when you think about those organizations that usually get the short end of the stick when it comes to funding, this significant influx of cash can be extraordinarily helpful for perpetuating departments of fish and wildlife and artificial reef management programs. I'm just gonna take you around the world on a quick trip to highlight some of the unique areas of the world that we're seeing rigs to reefs programs being developed. Here you see a map of the globe. Now, the red and yellow represent oil and gas fields, and blue represents where we are actively drilling for offshore oil. As you can see from this map of the globe, 
oil and gas production has, occurs almost ubiquitously around the world, indicating that we find these offshore oil and gas platforms in every ocean on the planet. But let's take a closer look at some of these unique case studies of oil platforms and how they're being utilized throughout the world's oceans. Our first stop is going to be in the Gulf of Mexico, birthplace of the Rigs to Reefs program. In the Gulf of Mexico, they've reefed between 500 and 600 offshore oil and gas platforms. Although we do see other rigs to reefs programs throughout the United States, we have a rigs to reefs program in California, there's one in Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Rigs to reefs is the birthplace, California, rig, Gulf, Gulf of Mexico is the birthplace of a rigs to reefs program. Now, California, unlike the Gulf of Mexico that's reefed 500 platforms, has reefed exactly zero of our offshore platforms. Now, the Gulf of Mexico, where the Riggs Reef program was started in the late 1980s, as I shared, has reefed over 500 offshore oil and gas structures. It's a popular program there. It's extremely popular with commercial and recreational fishermen who love to go out to the platforms on the weekend to go fishing. Now, we do see a unique example off the coast of North Carolina where a platform structure was repurposed into the world's most dangerous hotel. So it's an actual ecotourism resort where you can stay on the surface of the hotel and go fishing in the waters that are around it. Now, let's take a trip over to Malaysia, where we find a very unique example of a jack-up rig that has been converted into an ecotourism resort. We had the opportunity to go dive on this ecotourism resort back in 2017, where we compared the biodiversity found on the rig compared to the natural reefs. And our findings were extremely unique in that we were finding significant populations of fish in both the natural reefs as compared to the oil platform reef. Now, as we head over to Gabon in Africa, we find actually an offshore oil and gas platform that has been incorporated into Africa's largest marine reserve. The reason being that when Dr. Enlik Sala, a National Geographic explorer, went to Gabon and he explored the platform there, he found significant levels of biodiversity and fisheries abundance. Welcome back from your trip. You can learn more about what we do at the Blue Latitudes Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit organization through our social media channels, as well as on our website. You can also dive in with us on some of our YouTube videos on our YouTube channel, Science CTV. You can always feel free to reach out to myself or my co-founder, Amber Sparks at emily at bluelatitudes.org and amber at bluelatitudes.org. Thank you so much. Wow, Emily, thank you so much for sharing this work. It's something that is just so unique and so different when uh, we're talking about biodiversity. Um, it must be really interesting to just sit in the room with all the with people in the offshore oil industry and talk to them about how you know these structures can really um, be a positive change for um, the reefs. It is, especially when you consider it's so unexpected. You know, you would never expect to find that kind of biodiversity on an offshore oil and gas platform, something that's associated with something so negative. And we see it as such a silver lining because the reality is we all use our oceans. We use them for food production. We use them for energy production, transportation. And we need to start to figure out ways where we can sustainably use the ocean, recognizing that this use is going to continue. And we see this really unique opportunity where on oil platforms, we're finding protected, beautiful habitats that are really have um, sh are sheltered from most of mankind because no one is able to access most of these platforms. So they create these unique, massive marine ecosystems that are relatively untouched. Wow, really neat. Um, now I have to ask, when you, you were right, when you think of offshore oil rigs, you think of kind of oil spills and the danger around that. So is it really safe for divers and for the animals that exist on these uh, rigs? You know, there's always going to be a threat of an oil spill. The second that we place an offshore oil well into our oceans, that is the reality that we are going to be facing. 
But when we think about the platforms that have been converted into artificial reefs, and that's where we start to see um, these long-term reefs that are lasting, you know, well past when the oil is actually being drilled. So when the oil platform is, the operator makes a decision to reef the structure, they seal and cap the well, and then they remove all of the drilling infrastructure. Now, because there's a well there, there's always going to be risk of a spill. But in today's modern day, we really don't see that many spills from these oil wells that have been sealed and capped. And so what we're looking at is the jacket structure. And that's what's left behind as the permanent artificial reef structure. And that's where we're seeing all these levels of marine life and things like that. And it's a very safe environment for divers. It's a very safe environment for the marine life that can be found there. Um, but like I said, that's the reality of oil and gas development. Once we place an oil well into the ground, there is always going to be that risk. And that's the unfortunate reality of oil and gas development. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned diving on these reefs is like nothing you've ever done before. So for all the divers out there, what is it, what is it like and why is it different than diving on in, in other reefs? I think what makes it so unique is how unexpected it is. The first, I so vividly remember the first time I ever dove on an oil platform. It was in Santa Barbara and I'm from New England. So I'd never even seen an oil platform up close. So you pull up to these platforms, they're massive, they're, they're working. So it's very, very loud. You can hear the cruise ships coming in and out. They can hear the vibrations. And it's a little bit intimidating because they're, you know, you associate it with something so negative. And then the second you roll, roll below the surface, you're looking at a reef the size of the Empire State Building that stretches all the way to the seafloor. It's almost like you want to lift your head out of the water and make sure that's exactly what you're looking at is an oil platform. And you see massive schools of fish. Every inch of every cross beam and beam is totally covered in life. It's unlike anything I've ever experienced before as a diver. Wow. And so I'm curious how this all got started. I'm guessing these rigs existed and people started noticing, was it people started fishing nearby them and noticed that they had a, a rich biodiversity? Um, how did it all get discovered? That's a great question. It, it originated in the Gulf of Mexico and the idea actually came from fishermen. Fishermen are very wise as to where they might find the best fishing spots. They know where the fish are. So they had been using offshore oil and gas platforms as fisheries hotspots. They knew that going out there on the weekends was the best guarantee of getting a really big fish. Um, and then in the late 1980s, early 90s, as you know, when we first put in oil platforms, there was this expectation they're going to be there forever. People didn't really think about them being removed. And so when they started getting removed in the late 80s and early 90s, fishermen caught wind of this and were like, wait a minute, I don't want to lose my fishing hotspot. These are really important fisheries habitats. And so that's really where the impetus behind the Rigs to Reach program came from was from fishermen. Wow, really cool. And, and what's the biggest challenge? I'm sure there's private companies and they might have rights to these rigs. There are um, the local governments that might have rights to the land. There are fishermen who might have, you know, groups to try to protect um, the rigs. How does it, I guess, work politically with all these different um, players involved? You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, you know, when you think about what are the greatest challenges that are associated with this program. And the greatest challenge is that we are running out of time to protect these reefs because these oil platforms are increasingly being removed. We're moving away from offshore oil and gas. Um, and so we're going to be losing a lot of these habitats. And there's so many different players involved. There's the federal government, there's the state government, there's the public, there's the oil company stakeholders themselves. And most offshore oil platforms, I would say somewhere around 80 to 90% are usually just totally removed. There are thousands of offshore oil and gas platforms and every single one has a marine ecosystem attached to it. And the reality is when an oil company brings it on shore, especially those platforms that are near to shore, they're, they're gonna make a lot more money by re being able to pull it out and scrap it and recycle it. So not every platform is a good candidate for reefing. It could be near the mouth of a river. And so it's going to experience lots of erosion and sedimentation and runoff. And so we're not going to advocate for those to be reefed. So we're looking at the platforms that can be reefed and then advocating that those be able to stay in place. And it needs to present a win-win-win scenario. So it needs to be something that the public is comfortable with. 
not, you know, commercial trawlers, they don't like this program because they can't trawl across an offshore oil and gas platform. So we need to make sure this is something that's comfortable with fishermen, with different NGOs, with federal and state governments. And especially in California, increasingly, you know, a lot of these platforms were put in tribal waters. So we want to make sure that tribal groups are also represented in these in these discussions. Yeah, interesting. Um, and to think that there are thousands of them around the world, um, which all represent an ecosystem um, that you're aiming to protect. I'm curious where your favorite one is. You've probably d dove on a bunch of different uh, rigs to reefs. And which ones are your favorites and why? That's a great question. So, you know, I've, I've been, I've visited, I've gone diving on the platforms in Malaysia and in the Gulf of Mexico and in California. And every single one is a unique ecosystem. You know, California presents challenges. It's cold. So you're wearing a seven mil wetsuit, a full hood. Some days you can see hundred feet across the water column. Other days it's, you can't see your hand in front of your face. So the conditions can be more variable. Now that's in opposition to the Gulf of Mexico or in Malaysia, where we get beautiful visibility, spectacular colors, and it's warm. You can just wear, you know, a shorty or no wetsuit at all. So, you know, when it comes to comfort level in diving, I think it's always more comfortable to visit those warm water rigs. But the California rigs will always hold a special place in my heart because it's truly, California's platforms are truly spectacular. They're some of the oldest and largest in the entire world. So the ecosystems there are very well developed. I've never seen bait balls the way I've seen them on California's oil platforms. Wow. Well, as a diver, I really want to, to go to one of these. Um, I know in the diving community, people talk about uh, reefs that have changed so much over the last 20 years and are impacted and, and really losing a lot of that biodiversity. Um, so this is next on my list after seeing your presentation. How do divers get involved and maybe other people who want to check out these hotels or um, how do you how do you go and find these places and dive? Well, luckily in California, there's a lot of groups that will take you out there. A lot of different dive groups that are based out of Long Beach and Los Angeles that are always visiting these platforms. It's kind of like a, you know, a terribly kept secret how great these are in California. And there's three that you can dive on and easily access in California. Eureka, Ellie and Ellen. The other ones, the oil companies don't allow you to visit them. In the Gulf of Mexico, there's various charters that will take you out diving on the platforms. There's a really unique group um, that takes you out on a vessel called the Fling, and they'll take you to a platform that was actually incorporated in, it's the first ever oil platform to be incorporated into a national marine sanctuary in the United States after it had been decommissioned as a reef. Um, so there's various charters that you can go out and visit on these platforms. It's it's cool. I, I mean, I can't tell, I can't talk about it enough. I just think everybody, if you're a diver, this is, you got to add this to your bucket list of sites to see. It's definitely on mine. Um, and so what's next for Blue Latitudes and um, really where's your work centered? And is there any way that people can get involved if um, they really want to support your mission? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, so, you know, like I mentioned, oil and gas is on its way out and we're looking at offshore wind coming in. And so we've learned that there's a lot of lessons that can be applied from our work on offshore oil and gas platforms that can be applied to the development of offshore wind farms. So I recently relocated to the East Coast of the United States, and we're hoping to apply these lessons learned to all the offshore wind development that's gonna be coming on in New England. We're already seeing platforms being planned for off the coast of New York, maybe off the Gulf of Maine. So we're hoping to transition more of our work into the offshore wind space. What Blue Latitudes does is we focus on areas of our oceans that occur at the intersection of industry and the environment. And they haven't had a negative impact. They've actually had a positive one. And we want to understand why that is. So Riggs to Reefs is a great example of that. And also thinking about the potential for wind farms and what they can do to produce reefs. Um, you can always visit our website, bluelatitudesfoundation.org. And we are always running different public events. We do um, a dive a platform trip out to the California oil platforms in the fall to go diving on them. We also do various um, beach cleanups and other ocean awareness activities throughout the course of the year. So there's lots of opportunities to get involved and volunteer. Um, and of course, you know, spreading the word, you know, not most people never think of oil platforms as reefs. So just even telling one other person about this incredible resource that you just learned about is really helpful to us as an organization. 
Wow. Well, I'll be, I'll be telling some divers about it for sure. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, and happy Global BioFest. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a fun day.